I want to introduce my friend Jake Farrago. Um, come on, come on up, Jake. Uh, so Jake, uh, Jaden was uh, Jake's assistant Jayden. for. Uh, it was like a, a nice long weekend, but I think it went really well. Um, so anytime I have the opportunity to bring in a guest lecturer who has other experiences in the field, I just think that's that was always my favorite day in film yeah. school was a guest a guest coming in because you hear from that other person for 16 weeks. So. You're currently located in LA, but you're not from LA, you're from Boston, right? Uh, yeah, New England. I grew up in Maine. Um, so, and then the relation to Kansas is like a weird, I'll, I'll mention it at the end, but um, yeah, I grew up in a small town in Maine, and then I ended up going to LA, which I can talk about too, uh, quickly. Yeah, so whatever you would like to go into, I'll get out of your way. And Can I hook into the HDMI? Does it let me do that? I think I have an adapter too. We can try. <clears throat> um, it depends on what connection. Let's see. Oh, yeah, if you got your own, you just put it in. It won't be a problem at all. Zoe and I have been tinkering with this. I don't think you would think what is that? Oh, yeah, oh, nice. No, you're right. That's OK. We have. We, Will you, can you do a screen record for oh, yeah. time for us? Yeah. Just to make you do a little producing, too. Um, but yeah, so he, his experience is pretty broad. I'm not going to try and say I have his background memorized, so I'll let Jake take over and I'll just. And we're kind of improving this, which is perfect because it actually leads into, I think, a really important part of what, like, actually working like the film industry is, which is like a lot of just like improv, go with the flow, um, because. Let's jump I mean, on that opportunity. Yeah, you'll see. Like, there. Um, at least I can speak for when I was. When I was in the same program like this, um, I went to one year of film school, and then I um, quickly, like, I basically thought it was like a little too stressful and like too competitiony, and it wasn't even like a big school; it was like a New Hampshire school. So then I, I pivoted and did video game design. Um, that's all just to give you context for like, I had no clue like how, and there's no straight line for like how you get into film industry. Like I was just kind of like, oh, this seems interesting, and then I was like, well, I kind of like this more. Um, and then after college, I was like, I literally have no idea what I'm doing. So I ended up just kind of like doing a road trip out to LA with a friend. And <clears throat> it's kind of a stupid idea when you don't know anyone there and you're like, you have no money and you're just trying to like figure it out. But um, what it did allow me to do was what I was talking about before, which is kind of like you, you improv in the moment and kind of go with the flow. Um, I don't come from like a background where like I know people. Um, in the industry or, or anything like that, which would have really helped. That's another thing I could talk about is like when you have connections and everyone talks about it, but it is important. Um, just not always in like, people always assume, I know I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit, but people always assume when you go in the industry, you need to know like an executive or blah, 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 all this stuff. Really what it comes down to is if you're working with other people and um, social and actually care about other people, those people then care about you and then, then when people go through the industry, they bring you up with them. So that's like the biggest uh, thing I can emphasize is really when you go out there, it's focusing on the thing you really like to do, whether it's like production. Um, I come more from a writing background, but any of that's almost irrelevant. If you just, if you actually are just like a human being and care about other people, then that kind of creates your own network of people who want to help you out because it's like a natural human thing. Um, so when I, went into, when I went to LA, I was like, okay, one, like, how do I survive? And like, how do I eat? And like, and it's also really expensive to live there. So um, I basically started doing, um, for the first six months, I was like a video game tester, which was like a three hour commute. Uh, um, then I was like, okay, I can't do this. It's not like feasible anymore. And so I started doing like cold calling and just going to all these like studios. Um, and I say studios, like they're not gonna let you into like a Warner Brothers gate or a Disney gate. Trust me, I've tried and I've gotten also chased away by the, the Disney police there. So um, once, you, once you understand that, you also start going to these kind of like smaller companies. Um, I, I actually ended up at a VFX house, um, which is all the, like the VFX. Um, they also did like Marvel. Um, that was like the big thing was back in the day they were doing like all the Marvel films. Now there's like even double the amount of work. But um, at the time it was like they were kind of the big house for like whenever Marvel had their VFX, they, sh they brought them to the studio and then people crunched for like six months working on it. Um, so I ended up getting a job there as a, um, basically like an operations assistant. It was a, 
it was within that company we were doing, there was a special unit that was working on this new kind of up and coming technology that was uh, virtual production, which is a perfect segue into, this is kind of an intro to production class, right? Um, yeah. So when Bobby told me that, I'm like, oh, I'm like, ah. Oh. Like I know I have, so I've done some stuff on set, um, but I was like, it's just gonna be the same rehash of like, yeah, I worked on like, you know, student films, or I've gone and done like kind of like small uh, budget stuff in LA. I've just kind of helped out on set. But then I was like, you know, there is a really interesting tie into um, virtual production, which is actually what I ended up being like adjacent part of, which no one knew what it was really at the time. It was kind of just improv in the moment. Um, so the studio that I was at, did, again, VFX, they were working on a division that did like virtual reality and augmented reality, everything dealing with kind of how you bring the digital world into like the real world. And so we kind of got to be firsthand at like this, these attempts at, okay, how do we start creating projects that aren't just all filmed physically with like physical sets? How do you merge? There was green screen before, but the problem was with people with actors, you would have, they would shoot for six months on a green screen and no one would have context of like, what they're looking at, what they're interacting with. The director would kind of be like, yeah, this is probably the shot. And then later, six months later, they'd have to go into the VFX house and be like, uh, this looks or this needs to be changed. And then it would be a whole process. So what, as part of the like subdivision I ended up like low totem pole working at was they were figuring out, okay, how do we blend these things into one thing? Um, and this is important because you're gonna see this a lot now, um, but back then, some of the big examples were actually something like The Lion King. I don't know if anyone saw like the most recent one that was like uh, basically this, this version, um, which is like all the in like 3D um, CGI. So that's a perfect example of when they started kind of doing how do we, well actually before this I think Jungle Book did this a little more, but this was like a full on attempt at like how do we film something fully in CGI, but also not just have everyone gathered around a computer being like, I think, I think this looks good, that looks good. What they did was they started blending with technology like virtual reality where they would be able to have a set physically and actually have a preview of what you're looking at. So you could move, like you would probably do in this class, you'll be able to actually move physically all these the camera stuff, you know, you'll have dollies, uh, everything like that, but you're still doing it within a virtual environment. Um, John, I think it's Favreau, I always mispronounce his last name, was like a big proponent of this, and that's what led into things like after he shot this, which was again using like virtual reality, where you actually go in. Um, I forget. I, I forget what, whether I heard this in work or, um, but basically, I heard a story where he actually went into the headset. He would spend like hours in there, and like they'd have to also set up these shots in virtual reality. And someone at some point was like, the shots ruined. Someone made like a bunch of rocks. They were just like piling rocks randomly for no reason into the set. Like on the Sahara, they had like the virtual environment and someone randomly had like piled a bunch of rocks and they're like the shots ruined like we need to like who they were like who did this we need to fire them and they realized it was just john favreau like in his spare time just like casually just like taking like virtual uh, rocks and making little things for fun um so that's the kind of weird blend that started happening where it was like okay we can do this stuff not just on a green screen with no contact we can actually take this into re the real world and take some of the the techniques we know from the past 100 years and then bring it into this new kind of frontier of how do we actually film things that are not real. Um, so Lion King was a great example of that. And then obviously um, The Mandalorian was like kind of a next step for this. So this is the Star Wars show. Um, basically at that point, when we were still in Lion King uh, era, this was still very much like you'd look on screens, like, like a flat screen exactly like this, to get a sense of like what you're seeing in the virtual world. And then they're like, okay, how do we bring the virtual world out more so the actors can really see where they're at? And this is the, um, I forget the term, there's a, there's, a, there's a specific term they have for this the uh, dome thing um, that they call, at least uh, Lucasfilm calls it. But basically, they would take this, all this background is all virtual um, and actually is all running usually in real time. So what they can do is, they, someone creates this beforehand and then they'll plop the actors in with some physical sets, like you can see obviously some of the set here. But this whole world behind, that the actor has context for acting and, and knowing what's happening, they're actually, that's able, that's able to change in real time. So if they don't like something in the shot, they can immediately remove it. They can actually change the space where you're at. So this could immediately change to like a desert environment, um, anything like that, which is fascinating because this is again the next step of like taking things out of 
the virtual world and then bring into the physical world, which is why it's called virtual production. Um, so the context for like how I worked on this was we were um, kind of consulting on this, but also dealing with two other clients that really had uh, focus. Because again, we were more on like virtual, uh, virtual reality, which is like with the goggles, and AR, which is where you're seeing things in the real world that are overlaid with augmented reality, like Pokemon Go, if you've ever done things like that. Um, so the stuff that we got to do with that were specifically things like um, for when they were doing Warner Brothers, doing like Justice League, they're like, okay, we want to take our project and do like a virtual reality thing with it. So we got to work on that, which is really cool because we got to um, basically get scans on, and go to the set stuff too and pull stuff from the set um, and create stuff that was really pulled from that world into virtual reality. Um, so I got to work on this, which is really cool. Uh, got to do like actually writing on this, which is like a fun, at this point, I was an operations assistant and then after working kind of like hustling and doing like just basically doing my job, people were like, oh, I think you're great at this. Maybe can you help out with this? Or I heard you like writing, which is my focus. Um, can you maybe write something for this? Because at this point, they don't have a dedicated writer on staff to do this stuff. They're kind of jumping from project to project. And when Warner Brothers reaches out and says, hey, we have a Justice League project, um, can you create this experience? And also, yeah, we want like s some story to it. There's no one there dedicated on staff to do it. So that's what I, when I talk about like two things, improving and kind of going with the flow. Because if you are rigid and you're like, this is the only way I'm going to break into the in industry. This is the only way I can actually do what I want to do. Um, you really block yourself out from the ability to get other ways in. So if I had said, I don't want to do an operations assistant, like that's, that has no relevance, especially at a VFX house. I'm like, I want to do writing stuff. Um, I would have never been able to get to this point, which is then kind of that foot in the door where you can actually start writing for industry things. Um, and the other point is the social aspect. So if you like care about people on the team, um, they reflect that, that same kind of like, uh, compassion and then they're like oh I remember because I care about you that you wanted to do this thing why don't we let you do this work so that was the process where when we had this virtual reality project for Warner Brothers it was one really cool because we got to actually grab a lot of like the suits from set like the Superman suit and the Wonder Woman suit and I'll actually side uh, funny story um, no one at Warner Brothers knew that Wonder Woman was gonna be big when it came out like no one did. So the moment it went gangbusters at the stu uh, at the uh, box office, the call we got like the weekend after was, "Hey, so whatever you have for this project, can you basically just make it like more Wonder Woman?" -y? That was like that's how things work in the in, in the industry. No one really knows. Um, and so when when something big happens, everyone wants to capitalize on it. So yeah, we ended up like expanding like the Wonder Woman aspect of of the project. Um, so this basically this is like a a virtual reality where you have like all these mini games of the different like heroes. It was, it was fun. Um, and then we had another project for um, Lionsgate, um, which was really cool. Um, again, at the point where I was like helping out more like a assistant producer kind of thing. And they're like, oh yeah, uh, we know you like writing and also like you have, um, maybe you want to tag along and like watch some mocap stuff and help out with mocap. So I got to do this. This was for like the Robin Hood movie that came out years ago. I never saw it. Um, but they needed an experience for it, which is like a virtual reality thing. And so I got to do the lines for, I think it's Taryn Egerton. Yeah, I forget his last name. Um, really cool. They went out to Europe to record his stuff. And then I got to be on the set when we did all the mocap stuff. So speaking of mocap, so that was like kind of my first like in on that. Um, again, taking production, which you would normally think an intro production, you're like, I either do the camera, I do the lights. All that stuff is super important. But there's also these kind of like, tentacles of all these different ways you can actually work in the industry. And mocap is one that has a big, big following, which I didn't know until I actually was like tagging along and then helping out. Until eventually, um, when they were working on Marvel stuff for Infinity War, they were like doing some like side commercial, I think, for Target. Like basically these VFX houses get fed like the main project and also all these side projects related to it. And so at that point I had been working um, there and also doing like helping out with mocap and also getting in the mocap suit. So they're like, hey, uh, do you want to like do mocap for like some Target commercial for Infinity War? So I got to do Thanos. Um, that's me, that shadow. Yes, that's like my big resume on the top. And even better, I got to be Black Panther shadow, which was super cool. So like 
Um, those things are like these weird, uh, mo like that was a mocap opportunity on in the studio where they're like, again, uh, we heard you can do this or like you have the ability to like, you're, you're, we like working with you and like you're up your game for anything, improving it. So then they threw me in like a really skin, skin tight suit and said, okay, now make like, uh, like kicks and like scratching as Black Panther, which was really, really cool. But again, if you had come into this and uh, if I had known what I was doing like years previous, like I would have no idea. You can't plan this stuff out. It really is. Um, you just have to like make attempts, put your, put your best foot forward. Um, but also it's really like it's a human connection thing. That's really what it comes down to. Um, and also it helps that like I didn't come from like I didn't grow up in LA. I didn't have any of these connections. When you do, like, it's a little easier because, like, the people you probably hung around with have these are more naturally involved in, in, in the industry. Because if the industry is really LA or New York or Georgia and Atlanta now, but um, so obviously the proximity of that is still important. But for someone who grew up in Maine, similar to like a small town in Kansas, and like had no connection to it, you really do just um, if you really love that and you, that's something you want to pursue. You can find a way to do it. Um, like it's it's scary in the beginning, but then you slowly make your way along, and the, the people that help you out carry you along to these things. Where then you can do going from like operations assistant, where I was like putting together uh, desks and tables, to like mocap stuff, where where I was doing stuff for like Marvel, um, to writing, which is really cool, and getting writing, getting to write for like studio adjacent projects. Um, all this stuff is super interesting, and it really all comes back to. The focus when I was when I was working on that stuff was AR and VR, which is all part of this kind of virtual production, um, which really is. If you talk to people now in the industry, all these VFX houses, you'll see all this stuff's kind of blending into one single thing. Before it was like, yeah, you had video games and you ha had like films and TV shows, and then it was like you had green screens and how do you, you bring the virtual world in there? And now it's getting to the point where things like this, you can take things out of the virtual world or you can bring people into the virtual world to do the stuff that they want to still create. Because at this point, you still have people who are like, we know the future is we want this kind of like crazy set or this kind of awesome CGI. But how do we do it in a way that doesn't like remove everyone from the process? How do we do it so you can have still people working on Boom or stuff like that or doing these uh, traditional jobs but within a new kind of like 2023 uh, uh, workflow? So I guess the biggest lesson out of all this is Two, three things beyond just like the specifics of getting to work in virtual production and things like that is really you kind of improv on the fly and you go with you go with the flow and say okay cool I'm here to help and I can do this stuff um, and I'm not locked into a certain path. Two is people is really is just kind of embracing people and understanding that people at the end of the day even the people you think aren't going to like traditionally help you those are the people that end up really caring about you and actually bring you along so you go from someone who comes out to LA with like no money and does not have a job to like an operations assistant like putting together tables to someone who's like doing mocap and writing to then an associate producer things like that that process doesn't happen um, without without other people so and then the last bit is you really are still always learning um, so I guess I kind of didn't give a breakdown I, I do more writing um, that's kind of my focus and even though I've did I've done all this stuff it was always trying to steer the ship to like more kind of the screenwriting side um, but you really are always learning these things. So um, as long as you're open to that, like today or yesterday I was doing After Effects. I've never cracked open After Effects, which is how you actually do a lot of like uh, post-production VFX stuff. But I was still learning yesterday. I'm like, oh, I can use this to accomplish this. Um, and I was realizing I still have to, like you never really stop learning on these things, whether it's writing, whether it's production. I think people assume once you hit a certain level, you're like, yeah, you're locked in and like that's what you do. Like, nine to five or in the film industry it's not nine to five but um you really are still always learning so even though like a class like this like which seems like a like the beginning steps like you'll end up coming full circle of like oh i'm still doing the same exact thing i was doing whenever i went to this class because you're still always trying to find new ways and the industry is always changing and which is this a perfect example like no one could have imagined this kind of stuff pre-2000 and even during the 2000s when they were doing like green screen stuff it was like yeah this is a totally different process we're never going to deal with people on, on, in actually filming stuff again but the reality was things change and people find new ways to make uh, projects work and stories and films that are really great 
So you always have to also still be open to learning things. Um, that's, I guess, the three big like mantras I'll repeat is improv and going with the flow. It's people, and then it's also still being open to learn. Those are so critical um, to the industry. Um, and so at this point, what I do now is focus more on writing, and I could give like a whole other lecture because I love screenwriting and the craft and like the form. But um, when we talked about like me coming in, I'm like, yeah, this would be cool to see just someone who is probably very similar and like starting kind of from like zero in a place that doesn't really have like a major film like um, industry. And then how does that person actually like make it in the industry? And the answer is everyone does it differently. But if you have kind of those core values or and keep kind of focused on those three core things, you can make it work. So there shouldn't be like, I, I always felt, at least for me, I don't know how all you feel, but when I was like in New England or in Maine, I was like, how am I ever gonna make it in like LA or New York? It just felt like impossible. Like, cause that just one, physically so far away, but two, the connections and the networks and not growing up there, that does kind of like hinder your ability or doesn't hinder it, but, but it doesn't, you don't get to get clued in on those things. So I always felt like there's no way, like how could I ever even make it into it? But when you talk to anyone, including myself, that's the process, that's the story of how everyone makes it out there. The majority of people don't come from LA, aren't hooked up to like all these connections or New York, but they go out there and they're willing to do those things um, and kind of go with the flow and make good relationships with people that that's how they end up in these uh, positions where someone can come in and say, this is how I did this, I did A, B, and C, and now I'm doing this. Um, so I guess if I had to leave it on like one kind of like closing note is really don't worry about the fact that you're doing intro to production um, right now in Hutchinson, Kansas, because that can literally mean anything you want it to mean. It can mean if you think it's going to be, oh, that means I don't really have much of a chance at things, or um, I feel like this is just kind of, uh, it's like a fun pro uh, class to do. But in reality, if you want it to be a class, this is literally the starting steps of this, uh, to actually get to this point where you can work in the industry and do the really, really fun projects and including be the mocap shadow for Black Panther. That's how I'm definitely ending my speech with that now. <laughs> any questions? Does anyone like, also want to ask about some stuff or like what I did um, or the process? Because I can also answer that too, or I'm happy to like end it on that. But um, yeah, any questions? Well, there's plenty of time, so please don't be shy. Um, I know you guys come from different areas, and everybody wants to end up somewhere, but we don't really know where that is. Yeah. It used to be LA, but you know, now like you mentioned Atlanta. You know, is so close, Boston, you could easily do that, yeah. So it doesn't have to be. Canada that. too, Canada has a lot just because of the tax incentives. Um, yeah, Canada, especially for VFX, like I remember getting the speech from like our head of studio being like, <laughs> they're like trying to tell us in a very um, soft and way that the reason that you will probably start having less jobs here is because the taxes in Canada are better and we're getting more money back. So they did that in a way that didn't sound like we're firing you, but in reality they were basically saying that or like hinting at that was the future. Um, but again, that means, you know, on one hand that sucks for people, but also there is now opportunity in Canada if you want to do stuff there. Georgia, like Bobby and I actually kind of really met trying to like get tax incentives for Kansas because I think for the project I'm doing, I know that's really important, but also Bobby at large knows how important that stuff is. Like, it, it's weird to say it, but the reason why people don't film or don't bring projects here isn't because they're like, oh, who wants to shoot in Kansas? People do want to shoot in Kansas or shoot anywhere, but at the end of the day, they're looking at a spreadsheet before they start this project being like, how much will this cost? How much can we get for the bang for the buck? And if they're getting money back from a state or a local level or anything like that or a country level like in, in Europe, they will shoot there, not because they think it's a better space, but because they know we're getting more money there. Um, that's a side tangent, but that's actually how Bobby and I met. So that, it, that also explains for like why you may not see projects around here. Like, why wouldn't someone film in Kansas? Um, or why can't I get a job in Kansas in the state that I'm from? Well, the reality is, it's because the industry doesn't exist here right now, and in order for that to happen, there's, like, there's multiple things that kind of have to click into place. And one of these, honestly, if people are being honest in the, in the film industry for the studios, is they realize it's all based on a money uh, proposition. They know, they, they know how much they're gonna spend on stuff and they don't wanna spend like a dollar more. Um, I feel like that we kinda got off track with that, but that's... Well, we've been talking about it. I mean, every class I've mentioned, the Grow Kansas you know, film initiative, yeah, yeah. pretty thoroughly. Yep. Can you, do you guys have any questions about his background to where he's 
got to now, because I'm going to have them pivot otherwise, and it's not that you can't go back to you know, something. No? I'm so offended so, that no one asked. <laughs> so, no, they, um, uh, we've been talking about that quite a bit yeah. in every class, just mentioning, like, I can't, do, do you have an update of where that is? Because I was showing them, yeah. I, them, I knew it went through the Senate, but I didn't know much since then, and it's been a busy couple of months. I think that was the same that place I left it at. Okay. I know it went to committee because it did yeah. get approved um, by various, like, in various forms. The last time I heard, um, on the House and the Senate, and they had to make that in committee to merge those and make that one. Now, I haven't heard any updates since then. It's been months. Um, so there are, there are people leading it, and I actually need to reach out and see the latest. Um, for my own, like, selfish reason, the reason I wanted that to go through um, is because I'm doing, this is how Bobby and I met, too, is I'm doing a project uh, or pitching a project and trying to get this made that's in Hutch, that's all uh, based in Hutch. Um, so talk about that for a little bit. Uh, Jaden knows this a little bit, but basically, um, I don't know if most people here know. I, they probably do, but it's more of like a background fact for people that the salt mines here, everyone knows that they have the salt mines here, and that they have literally every film in history around the world that have been like, that have influenced everyone for the like, past hundred years sitting in a salt mine um, in this town. So when people say like Hutch isn't special, I, I always say, like, imagine, like, the, the cosmic energy of, like, every single influential film, like, sitting in one place underneath your town. That's a fascinating, like, fact in itself. And so when I heard that fact, I was in L.A., and I was, I think, reading an article um, from, like, the year 2000 about this. Someone had gone down to the salt mines and was like, hey, yeah, there's this really cool, the, did you know they have all the films down here? One, that's amazing to me that that even is how they store films. I never knew they would throw them in a salt mine, and that's how they preserve them forever. Um, but two, I was like, this is such a weird thing in the middle of Kansas in a town I've never heard of. I had never heard of Hutchinson, Kansas. I'd never been to Kansas. So, and I was like, I don't know what Hutch is. And so, um, but I was like, this is a really interesting story about these films that have influenced everyone since the beginning of films are now preserved, like perfectly, they'll never be damaged. So that's the, that's the goal, that they're, that's why they're in the salt mine. But for these films to never have an audience again, to never be seen again, that was the whole like, purpose of films. Um, now they're sitting in like storage in the dark. Um, and I was like, oh, this is such a fun movie idea of like, what if these films need an audience again? Like they're dying down there, they're being forgotten. It's the year 2023, most people don't know what these films are anymore, like the characters. Um, and what if these films also, like you have the studios coming in and being like, we don't, this is also weirdly like real now. So I didn't, at the time I didn't know this, but like there's definitely, when the studios hit a point where they're losing money, or like now with streaming and they're like, oh shoot, we don't know how to make money anymore because we thought streaming was gonna make us money and we realize actually it doesn't make us money right now and we don't have the same kind of pull that we did for um, feature films in like theaters back then. So the whole premise of like these studio, the studios being like, why are we having all these physical films that we have to spend millions of dollars to store? Why can't we just fully transfer them to digital and call it good and get rid of the original films? Because they do spend millions to keep all that down there. Um, so that's why I was like, it'd be so cool if you had these two things of the films that aren't being seen anymore and the studios, for money reasons, are being like, we don't need these films anymore. Um, and with like a little movie magic, the characters from these old films come to life to try to find a way out of that mine. Um, and of course, since they're in Hutch, they would have to find someone to help them do that. Um, then the twist is the only person that can see them is a teenage girl who doesn't know what any of these films are. Like we're talking like 1920, 30s, like all these obscure characters. And when you're in the year 2023, those things aren't just as, as relevant, for most people, aren't as relevant anymore. Um, so that was the project that I actually ended up writing and that's why I got to Hutch in the first place, came to Kansas. Um, I've been coming here for years now, just kind of like jumping in and out, like learning more about Hutch. Um, earlier this year, a couple years ago, we shot, we did like a table read for the project here in, um, at the Fox. And then I, this, earlier this year with Jaden was there, we shot a little short, um, kind of like a proof of concept, like a scene from the movie. Um, so that's why like my interest in Kansas at large is because I know that this place is really, really special and most people don't know how special it is. Not just in like, um, it's special for a lot of reasons, but for, from the film industry perspective, every single film that's important, that's been important to any filmmaker now is stored here. And most people don't realize that. And um, so I want this place to be a hub for film because it really deserves to be. It's like, it's the final resting home for all of these uh, classic films. So that's how Bobby and I got involved 
uh, one with the project that I'm doing, but also being like, you know, we really should push to have Kansas be a hub because it is, and people just don't realize it. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, it's a long process and there's a lot of like legal stuff that goes with that and politics, but um, the goal is to eventually make this a, a space where you guys don't have to leave your state to like do film projects. Like you could still be here with your family, um, which is a really important thing. Cause I, like, like I went through, I had to go to LA to like get anything. I couldn't stay in Maine. I mean, you can stay in Maine and do projects, but the reality is you're not gonna have those same opportunities as like a New York, LA, um, Atlanta, Canada, things like that. So, um, and it only takes, Atlanta wasn't a big hub until recently. Same with Canada, those places weren't hubs until things like tax incentives. And that's why Bobby and I had tried to help work on that because that is really important um, to get films made. We talked about films that take place in Kansas being shot in other states yeah. and how frustrating that is. I mean, you can make Iowa look like Kansas, no problem. Or uh, Oklahoma, yeah, like they did. Like we several yeah. of Oklahoma and Missouri. Yeah. And yeah. Colorado's always had better initiatives, especially for students. They, they fund a lot more students yeah. than we do, too. Yeah. So those are things I've seen over the years, just the last couple decades of uh, why are we ignoring that, that opportunity to bring in $100 million projects. You know? And it's, it's frustrating because it's... That, but, still, but still, even the small stuff, it's like those... It's really a chicken or the egg thing. When people ask, like, why isn't there a film in Kansas? Well, it's like, well, there's no films in Kansas because no one films here because because no one films here, thus we're not gonna film here. And the reason people don't film here is because we need money. And without money, we're not gonna do that. It's like all these, this weird, like almost catch 22, but it just takes yeah. one person or one initiative to break that cycle and then have the ability to actually have, to grow a film industry. Um, so that's like a whole like, again, side tangent, but it is relevant to what you're doing here. I mean, the reality is you're facing, you're facing a future where Without that, you do have to go to these places I mentioned about if you really want to get work, or you can, or you can make your own studio uh, production company here. But that just it requires a lot more effort um, and hustle on your side versus just easily being like, oh, I know this production that's working, um, this movie that's filming for the next six months here. They need like PAs on set. Like to be able to do that and still live in Hutch or around Hutch is a really it's a big luxury, and that doesn't happen unless things like a film incentive or an industry starts growing here. Yeah, if you're not. You could absolutely have a really successful production company doing marketing pieces, wedding films, yeah. those kinds of things. Um, but if you're if you're looking into more of the Hollywood, Atlanta style, um, bigger production markets, we're 40 minutes from an international airport, and so we travel really well. You usually take the train, actually. I'm taking it tonight. Yeah, yeah I'm taking it yeah. out tonight. Yeah. Um, so we just sent my brothers. I sent them to Chicago over spring break to shoot a project, and. It was like 450 bucks to send two people on a round trip train ride, and they had a great time. They loved it. Yeah. So if you're willing to travel, that would be the other thing. So we've shot yeah. all over the world because living in Hutch is affordable to where we can travel and budget. That's so, a good point. So, yeah. yeah. The but you're probably going to be able to drive down the road and probably end up on another green screen later that day. And then to the, you know, if you're, you're less likely to do that. But I think Bobby's a perfect example. If you hustle, like the thing is, there's levels of what people are like. Um, Bobby's very entrepreneurial, so that helps to be able to like, when you have that, you can make things work where, wherever you are, including Hutchinson. Um, some people don't have that, like either want or drive, and so, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just like just another uh, level of things. But um, there's, then that's why people go to like LA or to New York or Atlanta, because they just wanna have a job they, they can go into that still works in the film industry, that they don't have to like be every day being like, how am I gonna make this work? They can go in and show up, and that's um, that's part of having like a mature industry. It's nice when you don't have to pitch yourself every single yeah project, for project yeah if, if that's the scenario. But uh, and that's other things we get into with like uh, our media law class and our production management class. We get into that business side and how you protect yourself and how you can set up like retainer deals so you can have that same client. Yeah. And you know you're basically earning a salary. And so like we have a Canadian uh, based client that we just plan. It's just a lot of planning. Get there and you come back and edit. So yeah. it's very doable, but yeah, that, that there is a hustle component to that yeah. too. Um, many of our clients that are t take place out of the region, we started talking years in advance. Yeah. Before we earn yeah. that trust to get our passports, you know, pushed through on our plane tickets and you know. But but it is if you want if you want a non uh, cubicle nine to five or uh, five to nine world, I guess, then uh, the film industry will never disappoint you in a boring way. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And 
it. So, uh, so your project, you shot a short this summer, <clears throat> or proof of concept. And so that's another thing we get into pretty heavily. Every short film yeah, is likely a bigger story, um, a broader story. And maybe you're just showing a scene. Maybe you're just sh introducing a, a character that might be in a, a, a library of characters. But that's how you keep it affordable so that you can sell that project and initiate that later. So when he came to Hutch, that was where we got connected. And then I think three or four students, Colton was going to help, but he broke mm -hmm. his, his wrist. Yeah. So we had, we had a, at least three, and I think four was planned yeah. to, to work on that. Yeah. And so um, I think it was, a, it was a great experience. I think they really enjoyed that. And you, yeah. everybody was pretty much from the area for the most part that you needed to like get that proof of concept handled. Yeah, and that was the goal too, was like I, oh, yeah, um, I want Hutch to not only be like, for this project, I think it's not only important that the project's based in, I mean, it's the story's based in Hutch, but I wanted to really pull in people from the area because I know having come here over the years now and seeing what potential is, I think that's something that's important. If like you're gonna grow this, it, there's people that are around here that can do that job. It doesn't have to just be people from LA or, or New York, um, uh, one, because you have to fly them out, and, but two, but because there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of talent and potential here, and I think it's just something that's not tapped into. Um, so that's kind of the reason why when we shot the short was I wanted to also bring people that, whether it's like Bobby as connections or anything like that, or people from Wichita. Um, and yeah, so that's, we're almost done with that. We're, I'm just finishing, it's taken a while, even for like a three minute um, proof of concept, but. Oh, and not to mention a lot of your team was alumni too. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah. yeah. Just not even on set, but like Matt and Austin. So yeah. They're really strong uh, post-production people. And that's the that's the thing I guess you, that ties into we talk about like people and relationships like those those because those people you had a good relationship with when I came and like needed like someone to do that kind of stuff you were like yeah I know A B and C so those are yeah um, but uh, yeah so this is basically I mean this is just the pitch deck um, so a pitch deck we haven't covered too much yet but when you want to build a big project that you can't just grab your buddies out of the dorm and go shoot real fast down at you know um, Dillon Nature Center like we literally did last week oh yeah with uh, our advanced uh, cinematography class these are really really popular in fact people make a really good living building these pitch decks I I just got quoted thirteen thousand dollars by a design team to build a pitch deck for one of our documentaries Needless to say, thirteen thousand dollars would like get the film done for me. Yeah, at that point, you're like, I just shoot the thing. Yeah, yeah. But if they do a beautiful job. So what he's doing is he's trying to build an early audience, but in this case, more likely investors and distribution yeah. connections. Maybe trying to get an actor involved. Maybe trying to find a, a DP that like has that style. But a pitch deck is showing what's in his head visually, but without putting years into production, like yeah. shooting and hoping it works. Because when you don't have that money and you don't have those people, it's how, and it's one of the ways to. This is the way you can do it. Um, and actually, I know this isn't like a writing class, but from screenwriting, this has become like a really big thing, uh, not recently, probably in the past five or six years. Um, before, as a writer, the assumption is always you just screenwrite, you do the story, and then like that's your job. But in reality, if you want to, you, you can do that at a level when you're writing professionally and getting jobs without af having to actually even get, like people want to work with you. But if you're a writer um, and you have a project, you need to like, this is the hustle thing, and try to create ways and pitch your stuff. And the like, the truth is, in 2023, no one wants to read, um, which sucks if you're a writer because that means no one wants to like look at your work. So you have to find ways that intrigue people, um, and especially convince them that I'm not going to waste like an hour reading a script. So like, I want to see what I'm getting into um, before I actually even like even read the first uh, the the first sentence. So this is a great way, pitch decks, one, for pitching your project, but two, even pitching at a level where you're not even like, you just have a script or a story. Um, so this was something that I had to learn to do because again, I didn't really know that was something that went along with um, writing. So I threw this together to kind of give a sense of like, this is the story about Hutch, like this is the story we're trying to tell. Um, always tying back, I'll keep like tying back to like going with the flow. Like, did I ever think I'd have to do like a pitch deck and do like, and spend hours in Photoshop and like trying to design things, no. But um, the, the, you just do what you can and find ways to like go with, go with what where things are going. Um, so yeah, that's just another example of like you're trying to the hustle aspect of it, but also finding ways that you can like make yourself um, you can make yourself so someone people want someone people want to work with. Without that, 
you're just gonna you're gonna sit there. If you're a writer, you're gonna have a story that no one's gonna read. If you're someone who's working on set, you're gonna sit there like asking or thinking about like why why can't I get any jobs? And the reality is, part of it is you just have to find these ways in because there's just so many other people that want that same position um, that you have to find people and improv and also keep learning. Um, this is all tied into that to be able to do the things you want to do. That's it. That's it. I feel like I went again off no, topic, but yeah, it's just a fun thing to. So you, your, uh, what's your runtime? You're estimating for your short. Um, I think it's like three minutes. I think we ended up cutting it to okay. three. Yeah. So whenever you're done with it, we'll show it to him. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link. Around. Yeah. Um, and then Jake also. So some of the other stuff is you start off in the film industry with a specific background that uh, is where you're strong. I was a, a photographer since I was a kid, so I naturally got into like a visual element but eventually you end up writing and producing mm. and directing. And then you have to learn how to edit because you yeah. can't afford the editor. And before you know it, you're, you're doing a little bit of everything. It's a really big reason why in this program we have everything from the screenwriting process all the way through the media law process yeah. and protecting yourself legally. You're not going to be an expert at any of it because of what I'm giving you. You're going to have to really grind and do other projects um, and other experiences but we're gonna dabble you in everything. So when your audio person doesn't show up, you can lob them up and you can keep moving and you're not stuck, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> it's one that's happened to me a lot is I'm always like the side audio guy in between directing or something. Yeah. Um, so he's done a lot of different things from writing the script was one component, but now you've had table reads. And now you've shot a short yeah. for a proof of concept. And the pitch and deck stuff, yeah. It's just pitch decks and mood boards and a website. <laughs> Yeah, but that's that's exactly it. Like you, and that's why it is important for like this program where you get a sense of like what everything is, so you don't feel. We require Photoshop. Do you really? Yeah. That that is so important. Yeah. That stuff because you would but think you, never know if you're gonna need you it. don't you don't know and until you do it, and especially if you have never touched it before, and all of a sudden someone, let's say you're actually working on set or with someone who's related to obviously film, and they're like, "Can you do this?" The reason why it's something like this is so important is because then when you have even like a, a taste of it, you can be like, oh yeah, I'm not like totally thrown, I, have to, I don't have to go in crisis mode. Like if you've done a little bit of Photoshop, you're like, yeah, sure, I can make it work. And I can learn and I can go with the flow on it. Um, that's why these things are like great because they're almost like safe zones to tr do these things without actually having someone yell at you. Because I'm not saying like that happens a lot in the film industry, but there is always high pressure. And so um, sometimes if you haven't done something, you definitely feel it if someone says, can you do this? So if you have a little bit, even like, a class, like an intro, whatever class, something like that, just a taste of it. It gives you that, um, it takes away the pressure and stress, and it gives you that like confidence to be like, yeah, I can make this work. Like, I'm not an expert. Obviously, I don't do this for a living, but can I make a pitch deck? Um, that's not what I focused on, but sure, I can make a pitch deck because I, I know a little bit of Photoshop, I can do some design stuff, but more importantly, I can learn, and that's what it comes down to is like, even after you leave this program, you're still gonna learn those things. Um, that basic understanding really helps you better be better at hiring and supervising too. Cause yeah. You're not yeah. likely always going to run audio while you're running a camera while you're you know script supervisor, but it's a, a very good chance that you are um, going to be hiring those roles and you need to know what to ask and what to look for. Yeah. And make sure that the people you're hiring are the experts for you to you know be that conductor. So that if you were conducting a, a band, you're going to know every instrument at yeah. least a little bit. You're probably not going to be better than everybody so any any other questions or any thoughts i know you guys are still kind of getting back in the groove i know at the very least we gave you like a good half hour just to chill and still like decompress after labor day weekend so you could like kind of half sleep while we're doing this yeah. which, which is fine i get it <laughs> Jaden, what what was something that you took from that experience that weekend i'll put you on the spot for a moment did you? Yeah, Jaden, tell us all about it. What did you learn? What did you think? <laughs> it was really positive, right? You really enjoyed it. <laughs> it, it, it was a really good group. I think there's a lot yeah. of positivity. So yeah. nothing's ever going to go perfect on a film set. We talk about that a lot. So you got to be adaptable and, yeah. and patient and optimistic. But I think things went really well. So yeah. But it's your vision. So how far do you think you are from your vision to where you ended up from when before, like when you're on the train here? Um, well, I don't, I, from like a personal like admitting, I think I always struggle with um, expectations like being higher. Like I have higher expectations for myself being able to pull things off. 
So um, yeah, I this is and this is something you'll probably all like deal with, whether it's film related or whatever. Like you'll never think like you'll be like, is this good enough? Like am I is what you have in your head will never really translate to what you end up getting. Um, so that's a that's but it's important to learn, like to understand like the sooner you understand that. The sooner you can also work through it. Because if you get stuck in that loop of like it's never good enough, I'm not good enough, like all those things, then it does prevent you from actually doing the things you're really good at and putting like all your energy into things. You're putting your energy into like a mental game of like thinking like why am I here? Like why am I doing this? I'm not even good enough, all that stuff. Like this isn't good enough. Um, so the process from what we did all the pre-production work on this short to then shooting it to then post-production. Um, along those steps, I've always been, I've had the roller coaster of like up and down of like, oh, this is great, this is shit, all this other stuff. Um, but I think it's gonna really turn out well and I think more importantly, um, you'd be surprised when people can see something. This is why we shot the short. Even a pitch deck, um, I must have exited out of it, but even a pitch deck, people still, at the end of the day, wanna see the film before they even talk to you about it. They wanna see what you're talking about. And of course, that's impossible because you haven't, sh the reason you're talking to them is because you wanna get the film made, so you can't show them a film that hasn't been made. But the more ways you can like remove that friction and uh, make it easy, because at the end of the day, we're all like, you know, like we all watch like, TikTok, YouTube, whatever, it's like you just want to see what you're, what someone's talking about. You don't want to have them talk to you about it. So um, that's why we shot the short, a proof of concept, is to give a sense, like a taste of it. Um, and for that reason, I think it's important, and I think it, it, it was worth it. Um, but it's all these things, you're always trying new ways to try to find, um, to find traction, to get your foot in the door. And if you feel like you hit a wall on one end, like you go another direction. Um, there really is no, like people will give you, and this whole school is about like, giving you the general steps and the tools to be able to figure it out. Um, but the reality is you really have to, in the moment, kind of figure out, no one will ever have your same path. So when you go down the path and you're, you have to zig and zag and find your own way in, um, if you think it's a pre-prescribed, like, it's not a, it's not a medical school. You don't go in, you go, like go for four years of like whatever residency and then four years of like, you don't do that. It's, the reality is there are general steps and tools that can help you. But then at that point, you're a bit of like a Bobby in this, that you have to be entrepreneurial. You have to kind of hustle and find your ways uh, in. And, but as long as you're being creative and you love what you're doing, it's not gonna feel like work. Like I still, f things like shooting a short, like that's not what I'm into, but um, I still loved it. And I found ways like to learn from that. So as long as you're still putting that same creative energy that you, the reason you're doing all this in the first place, then it's not gonna seem like work when someone says, hey, I need you to do this instead, or you're, this isn't working, let's try this you just take that same energy that you always have and that's like the core of who you are and then you apply it in a new direction, in a new way. And eventually, um, you'll find what, you're, what you need out of this and what you're looking for with it. Um, it just might take a few years, but that's okay. It'll, that's okay, that's, that's life, that's why we're here, so yeah. But you must have come in <clears throat> like three days before you guys even rolled a camera and with set deck. Yeah, and with his mom, to, yeah. To make, a, to make a high school girl's bedroom. Yeah out of what was my high school bedroom 20 years ago. And when your actresses came in, who yeah. had never been in the house, they just were like, oh, it kind of looks like my bedroom from high school. I was like, weird, that's my bedroom from high school. Yeah. I had no idea that like uh, like a stinky teenager had been in there, you know? Yeah, um, it was. <laughs> because it was, it was pink and it was lit up and it was, it was just like, it just felt like a- Good, it's good space. I don't know how else you could call it anything but a teenage girl's bedroom. Yeah. If we had not yeah, planned this, you know, just this morning, I would have been able to pull some of those stills because we took a lot of that. Yeah, I have the stills, and I do. I I don't have it with me, but I have some of the cut. Yeah, anyway, but it's a moot point. But yeah, um, it was really fun. I think Jaden took some of the posters, right? You got some of the. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, there's some good posters from there. My daughter still carries around the stuffed animals from. Oh from yeah, the the, the duck. And you yeah. guys are beating up Charlie. Yeah, yeah. That's a whole other really fascinating thing that if we had the photos, it would get a little more justice or some more behind the scenes. But his actor came from uh, Chicago to play Charlie Chaplin, and I was just uh, I was just blown away by how good he was. Ended up he's played Charlie Chaplin upwards of sixty times in his career. Yeah. And so, uh, how long did it take you to to cast that? Um, as a casting agent oh, a so that's the other thing too. Like, I if you're putting this together, I had to do casting, right? Like, if you're, I basically did like producing on this. So, casting is like looking around and and putting out. Um, I think we cast local in Wichita, and then 
for the specialization of like the someone to do like a Charlie Chaplin character, which is like a very 1920s slapstick kind of stuff. Like I had to look all over the country and be like, okay, who can do this? And there was someone in Chicago um, who, you know, zooming with people, casting, talking to them, um, and he was he was great. And so we brought him down, we flew him in, and um, another like again, you always think like. I, at least I did. Like, this is going to be my path in the industry. But then you end up being like a casting producer, like that you would never have that. You would never in a million years think you'd do that stuff. But um, you just have to do it if you want to get projects made and things done. That's just part of like the ebb and flow. Costume was authentic. Like, yeah, he brought that too. And he, really he like yeah. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not uncommon to, if you're ever trying to get a gig as an actor, which we don't cover that much. I probably told you before, Jake, that's really the theater department. So yeah. We're very much the other side of, of this industry, the acting and the makeup and set design, we don't hit quite as heavily as I'd like to. Um, but sometimes on these films, if you get cast, especially for like a, a period piece or something like that, they're likely to ask you what, what costuming you might bring just to save them the trouble. You have your own cowboy hat? Great, bring it. You got boots? Cool. Like that's not yep. uncommon at all if, you're, if you kind of build up, you know, build up your library, build up your portfolio, build up your skill set. But I save like, I'm trying to do a 1950s piece. I've been saving mm -hmm. pieces that I think would look 1950s-esque for a year and a half now. But and like, and you would have never thought you would have had yeah, to do I that. Yeah, antique stores before. <laughs> like five years ago, you'd be like, why would I ever have to have this skill yeah, for that? That's why I have that, that story in my head. Yeah. Like Hit garage sale with a different purpose. So uh, anything else you'd like to cover? Um, I don't think so. No, it was really fun, like, um, just kind of jumping in here. Yeah, I mean, we, we, I don't, I didn't have like a full like presentation, um, but I hope it like gives you a taste of just at the very least of like someone who basically is no one um, who is able to like still find their path and like get their way in there. And it's like, it never ends. And I'm still learning, like I said, like yesterday, I'm like opening up After Effects and doing stuff in there. But um, like if the one thing I just would want people to like take away from this is really just a sense of you can figure it out. It's just... Um, it may not go exactly how you think it is, like when you're in college right now and you're like, this is what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be this exact person. Uh, and I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna be doing this at this year and in this location. But if you're willing to have that like core creative energy, be flexible and like, and also be like, you know, just be a human being with other people, you can definitely make it work. There's nothing that prevents you from doing that. Um, so yeah, that's my one like takeaway. You can, you can have that for free, I won't even charge you for it. Cool. Well. Um, we still have a few minutes, so if you would like to, you know, hang out and ask you some questions or anything, um, we'll cover, we'll jump into the assignment Thursday morning and get you guys rolling in that. You're more than welcome to look at it, but I'm not going to cover much of that right now. It, you're real curious. It's pretty detailed and there's multiple videos. What are they working on for the next thing? The next one's focus racking. So oh, they have yeah. to move from subject to subject or move with the subject. Yeah. So we start off with the exposure triangle and just exposure. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting into more story. And then by October, it'll be full story driven. What is your camera telling people? You're piecing it up to get yeah. to the point. That's yeah, really we cool. Start, we started very small with like data management and then working our way into by Christmas, they'll have hopefully a small portfolio and maybe even a couple of short films. Short yeah. Films. Well, they already, you, I saw the stuff you were shooting already, right? They were already shooting things yeah. with the. They had a camera in their hands day two. I think day two when we checked That's out great. the cameras. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, nonstop. They'll shoot 50 projects of some sort from podcasts to like post things probably throughout the two, four semesters, two years, you know? Yeah. yeah. So cool. Well, thank you so much, Jake. Thank you. I appreciate it.